OK, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Adam Smith, Managing Director of AITT, and I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, webinar that we're running today, The Key to Effective Training. So, um, first, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we have some great speakers lined up for us, um, and we're going to try and fit as much into this information, into this event as possible in the short period of time we've got. Uh, first few things before I get started, uh, we will be running a poll at the end of each speaker, um, so feel free to contribute to any uh, feedback on that. Um, and also, if you have any questions throughout the event, um, there is a tab where you can submit your question um, under the Q&A se section. Um, we'll probably pick up questions at the end, um, but feel free to ask, ask anything as we go along. Um, so yes, we've got lots of got through. Um, the speakers we've got lined up for you today. Uh, first, we've got Liam Knight, our new technical manager uh, from AITT. Uh, we have Gary Rowland uh, from Greencore, uh, David Lee from HSC, and Simon Ambridge from Matthew Clark. Uh, so lots to get through. Um, so I think we need to start the event really. I've just got a bit of an introduction myself. Um, so if we look first to really at the key to effective training, um, to really kind of tee up this meeting and then how we actually get into the detail of it, I want to really look at Firstly, why, why is effective training important? So over the next few speakers, we're gonna look at how we get the most out of our operators uh, to make sure they operate their trucks safely and efficiently. Um, and obviously to ensure that they are correctly trained across all the material handling equipment they're potentially gonna operate as well. We're gonna look at how organizations can benefit from the effective training. Um, so these are things like looking at what so some of our um, speakers have already put in place on their own sites um, and how um, companies will gain that feedback from um, their own levels by speaking to their operators and, and how we can basically make improvements to the training that they offer. Also look at um, how you would identify and understand your requirements. So I think that's quite important when we look at uh, identifying the needs uh, for different types of training. Um, so we're going to look at the different types of certification that's available and ensure how to check that is correct and relevant for the right piece of equipment that your operators could be operating. And finally, the support out there as well. So obviously we're going to touch a little bit on what AITT can offer and the, the guidance HSE provide and obviously the network of AITT members um, and how they can also help as well. Okay, so um, if I start really... Um, I suppose you've got to start somewhere. The best place I believe to start is the guidance from the HSC, which is the L17. This is the approved code of practice of the lift trucks, um, which is uh, a document quite frequently referred to by many of our train providers and, and AITT. Um, I think it's most important really to really look at what it's here for. And this is, I suppose the most important part is the three elements of training we look at uh, within the document. This is referring to the authority to operate. So. Essentially, before anyone can operate a truck on, on their premises, they have to be given authority to operate. But that can only be done once the three levels of training have been conducted. So firstly, if we look at basic training, uh, basic training refers to the skills and knowledge required by the operator to operate the truck safely. Uh, this is effectively what your certificates or your training course uh, demonstrates. And that's why it's really crucial that we understand that we're checking operate certificates correctly. The second level is specific job training, and this is um, the knowledge and understanding of operating um, forklift um, or lift truck and the principles and controls and how they can be relevant to the workplace that they operate in as well. Sometimes this can, can be com combined with basic training. Um, and lastly, we'll look at the familiarization training, um, which is applying what has been learnt to that actual company's normal working conditions, and their safe systems at work, etc. Okay, so that kind of brings me on to introduce to our first speaker today. Um, so our first speaker is Liam Knight. Uh, Liam joined AITT uh, only a few months, uh, sorry, last month um, as our new technical manager. I've been previously worked at um, one of our, uh, sorry, at, um, one of the UK's largest haulage companies um, of where he was responsible for their internal training. So I'm going to hand you over to Liam now and um, then I'll speak to you shortly.
Thank you, Adam. I'll just request control of your screen. Thanks, Adam. So thanks, Adam, for that introduction. And um, just to go through um, a little bit about myself, um, I've worked at one of the UK's largest hauliers for the last nine years. Um, my role there was managing the staff training team. So that incorporated um, MHE training as a whole for that whole company. We had six MHE instructors based around the UK and we delivered that training in-house and it was my role to manage the rollout of that and the ongoing development of it. Um, recently joined AITT last month and thoroughly looking forward to getting started and working with Adam and the team. So a little bit about what we're gonna go through today then. So in this short session, we're gonna look through the workplace transport groupings, the history and the categories around that. We're gonna look into certification, so in-house versus accredited. We're also gonna look at how we check certificates, um, show you an example of a good certificate of what it should look like um, and what you can do back in your workplace or um, how you can check them certificates as well. We're gonna look at challenging certificates. So if you do have any concerns or you feel like there's any issues with certificates themselves, how you would go about challenging them with the relevant um, maybe job recruitment agency, for example. Um, and the final part is going to be training requirements. So is there a requirement for training? And also, um, if there is, for example, conversion training, how we would go about doing that. So into the first slide then. The HSE definition. So there needs to be a significant difference in how MHE is controlled um, and the environment in which it operates in. So under the pure regs, all employers must ensure that all persons who use work equipment receive um, adequate training. So what we're gonna look at through the next few slides is why if they're saying we need adequate training, how we go about that and looking at the different categories. So this leads us in nicely to the ABA um, category code. So initially they were recognized um, by the accrediting bodies adopting the BITA codes um, as a way to categorize different truck types. More recently in 2012, the ABA was formed as the governance, governance to the unified Uniform testing standards of these categories. So the current ABA category list now has 52 different categories of equipment. And if I link back to my previous slide, the list I'm going to show you below now is this makes the machines significantly different. Um, and that is the reason why training would be required. So we can see there in the category in the list, categories can change by lifting capacity, lifting height. And that makes them significantly different and explains the reason why we would need to provide um, additional training to our staff members and teams and things. Um, over the next few slides, we're going to look at some different categories. We've pinpointed some to talk through. It's not a conclusive list. We've just highlighted some of the, some of the trucks um, um, we're going to talk through. So the first category we're going to go through is the A category. So we've picked three different trucks out here. We've got A1, A2, and A5. So you can see three um, different trucks. So the A1 is pedestrian operated, A2 is rider operated, and A5 is where the stacking element comes into it as well. Three different trucks with three significant differences, all within one category. So this shows the importance of why we would need to provide further training. It's not a case of if you've got an A1 certificate of basic training, you can then go and operate an A5. There is different elements to that training, and we would need to provide further training in the forms of a conversion course, for example, which is something we will look at um, later on in the session. Another category we're gonna look at is the counterbalance category. So the B category, again, three different ones we've pinpointed here, B1, B2, and B3. The significant difference here is the lifting capacity. And a common question I was asked in my previous role was, if my candidate or my staff member has a B3 certificate, can they operate B1 and B2? And the simple answer is no, you can't. You need different, you need further training to operate them trucks, those different categories of trucks. And the reason is because there is a significant difference in the lifting capacity and the environment that they work in, which would determine um, further training. So a B1, for example, is potentially going to be picking up a wide variety of different types of loads and pallets you'd find in a standard warehouse. And B3 may be more spec'd for purpose and um, pick up very similar items like steel ingots and things obviously of a heavy weight. Um, so the lifting capacity and the working environment is the significant difference here um, and shows the reason why we would need further training. 
So another category we're going to look at is the D category, which is your reach trucks. Again, we've picked two out here, D1 and D2. Operate in very similar ways, but the difference here is the lift height. Um, again, a common question that always be asked is, we'd have agency assessments coming in and people would, candidates would have a D1 certificate and the trucks you may operate are D2, so over 8,001 millimetres. Can they operate a D2? Again, no, you'd need to provide further training. And the reason is because it, it, you're lifting to a, a greater height. So we wouldn't want to say to a candidate who may have only operated up to 7,000 mil or something, um, you're now going to lift to top level, which is a lot higher and they may be nervous and scared and things for that extra height. So you would need to provide further training. Next category we're going to look at is the E category. Important reason why we put this one in is it has recently changed. So E1 used to be up to 2,500 millimetres and it has now been changed to 3,000. Again, a similar theme with the with the reach category, the, the, the significant difference here is the lift height. So you can see that um, the E2 lifts up, uh, goes to a, it's a greater lift on that one. Next one we're going to look at is the VNA or the very narrow aisle. So the F category, we've got two here we're looking at, F1 um, and an F2. So F1 is your... Um, your VNA where the, the operator will go up in the air with the truck. So again, heights and things come into that, especially um, within the training. And an F2 would be where the operator stays on the ground with the with the truck. So operating similar ways, but a um, obviously the, the significant difference here is the operator position. And again, we would need to ensure that further training is provided to ensure that that candidate feels comfortable with the heights they're going to be operating at and that type of um, thing. So. It's, it's a really important part why you would need to provide further training for that. The last couple of categories we're going to look at before we go through certificate checking is going to be H and Z. So I focus on the Z category here because a lot of the time I used to be asked the question if do we really need to provide training for a pallet truck? And it was, yeah, you, you do under, as we said, linking back to the previous slides under the pure regulations, it, it's still classed as working equipment. So you do need to provide training on that, um, on a pallet truck, whether or not companies deliver that in-house or accredited through AITT, for example, it is it is needed, it is workplace equipment and yeah, you, you would need to provide it. The same with the H category, there's there's three different elements to that and different categories and to operate them different trucks, you would need um, training for them. So certification, so in-house versus accredited then, um, What's the employer perspective? So in-house certificates aren't verified, correct? Like if you're delivering the training in-house, you're not registering it with an accrediting body like AITT, for example. There's no way you can monitor that or verify it with an accrediting body. It would all be dealt with in-house. Um, not to be taken from one employer to another. So you'd often hear my certificate is in-house. I can't take that to my new trade, my new company, for example, a common phrase you might hear. But flipping this on, on the other side, there is a positive. It, it can be a good solution to, to companies and it does work for many companies, but you need to ensure that it is managed correctly. I know that, that in my previous role, managing that for one of the UK's lar largest hauliers, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good job, for stressful at times and things, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it needs to be managed correctly, especially when you've got maybe up to 2,000 operators around the country. You need to ensure that their certificates are valid and the paperwork you're using is correct and accurate and stuff so yeah it can work definitely but it needs to be managed correctly how do you check certification then so if you're in a position of having to check or review external certificates for, for new starters for example there are a few um relevant items that you need to check um that should should be on your certificate so if you're in that position where you're dealing with um agency assessments coming in or that type of thing and you need to check that the candidate has the right type of certificate what actually are you looking for so check if the training company is accredited so you can see on this certificate here as an example um you can check the company is accredited with aitt as the example look for the aba code so as we've just been mentioning in the previous slides um if you know you're recruiting for a d2 reach the reach truck for example look at the certificate and it will tell you what category that that candidate has received basic training and if it's not d2 you know that further training is going to be needed um check the certificate is accredited so one of the four accrediting bodies which we'll mention in a minute um it make sure it is accredited and it's been done by a 
by an accredit accrediting body. You can check if the instructor is registered. Um, if you have any doubt that that instructor isn't registered, you can check check with the relevant accrediting body to make sure they are. Um, look for the, um, the accrediting body verification number. So with AITT, you've got ACORNS, NORS for RTITB and ITSA has TOPS. So you can check that number with the accrediting body to make sure it is uh, as it should be. And if you're ever unsure with a certificate, check with the relevant accrediting body. It's something that is, is so easy to do. And if you are unsure of that certificate or you've got any doubts whatsoever, that's what, if, it, if the training has been delivered a credit to an accredited standard, you can check with that body. And that's the reason why we do it. Challenge certificates. So we've, we've just seen an example of what a good certificate looks like and you will get an access to that later so you can refer back to it. If you have any doubts with a certificate, don't be afraid to challenge it. I know in my previous role, I, I, I did challenge certificates and I would pester Adam, Adam and the team at AITT asking them to check certificates for me, but it was what we wanted to make sure that we had candidates coming into an accredited standard. It's what it's there for. Um, and I highly um, would recommend that if you're dealing with new starters and agency workers. Um, the certificate demonstrates what basic training a candidate has had. So checking that is key. Um, especially if you're going to be taking them on to work in your business. Um, you, you might deal with recruitment agencies, which would send you a high volume of certificates to check. Sometimes a recruitment agency might not know the difference between these ABA categories. So um, a little golden nugget we'll leave you with at the end of today is access to the ABA categories with pictures, which will give you a really good foot, foot in the door, really, to check what categories you've got on your site and what you should be looking for. So you can then re refer back to an agency and say, look, we're looking for D2 um, reach truck operators and they can put that on an advert, for example, and actually know what they're recruiting for. Um, and internal certification as well. So if you are working for a company where you deliver in-house training at the moment and you check your certificates and think, oh, we don't include the ABA code, the, the instructor doesn't put their, their um, registration number on there, challenge that and say, look, I need to be able to know what category of truck this candidate has been trained in can we put it on the certificate so i know that right joe blogs has got a d2 qualification and it just makes life um, that little bit easier for you so training requirements then um how do we identify the need um that th there is a need for training so you can conduct a risk assessment um if you if you do operate different categories on your sites ask yourself do the staff members have the relevant training to operate safely so if you know you're operating all three different types of counterbalance lift truck do you have up-to-date refreshers for a b1 b2 and b3 you're not going down that route of well they've got a b3 so they can operate anything down below um which we have heard in the past it's it's making sure you've got that um up to date if you're planning to bring new equipment in, do your staff members require any further training? Again, previous experience, managers may bring in new pieces of equipment and then realise, oh, we don't have anyone signed off um, or trained to a basic basic training to operate that lift truck. So make sure you're pre-planning that. If you're bringing new equipment in, like if you're upgrading your reaches from a D1 to a D2, you are going to need further training. So you can pre-plan that and it just helps get everything running smoothly as it should be. Um. And if no to any of the above, operator training is required. Now, when I say operator training, I'm not saying that everyone here would need a lengthy novice course, for example. They may have already sat that. So if they've sat a novice course for a counterbalance B1, for example, and then you need them to operate a pivot steer truck, so a P1, um, many trucks share similar features, but the, there will still be a significant difference between them. But it is possible that you can convert um, one skill to another, which is the, which is is good because it is a shorter course. Um, as it says, it removes the need for lengthy training courses. A shorter training co conversion courses um, can be completed instead. So I'm just going to leave you with my final slide. So some supporting documentation. So the link that is provided there um, has got some great free content for you to download. So as I mentioned previously, you've got the ABA grouping list with pictures, which you can see an example of there. Great piece of great piece of um, information. If you take anything away, it will give you examples of what that truck is and the different categories it falls into. Especially if you're not familiar with the ABA categories, that is a, is a must. You have a, have a review of it and make sure you are aware. Um, there'll be some documentation to say the typical course duration and a conversion calculation list. And finally, there will be uh, an example of the correct certification so you can compare that to what you're using and make sure that it is um up to standard really so thanks for listening i'll now hand back to adam 
give you can control back, Adam. Thanks, Liam. Um, thank you for that. Uh, first things first, uh, we just launched the poll, uh, so please feel free to give your feedback on that. Uh, this is obviously for when reviewing new Star Trek publications, do you? And then please give your feedback. Um, thanks very much for that, Liam. Um, it's a really interesting uh, presentation. Um, I think it's really important that people are aware of these different types of categories that currently exist um, to make sure they're adequately trained. And I think having that along with checking certification uh, will really ensure that people have got the right qualifications and skills for the right bits of equipment. Um, so yeah, that's really useful. Thank you very much. And if just to reiterate, if anyone needs access to that supportive information, it's on the AITT website under our news page. So you can just click on there and, and download it at your leisure. Okay, so um, if we move on to the next speaker. Um, so, um, now I'd like to introduce to you uh, Gary Rowland. Uh, Gary is the Group Compliance Training Manager at Green Core. Uh, Green Core have been members with AITT since 2019. Uh, they currently employ in-house AITT registered instructors. Um, and Gary's here today to obviously give you insight on how Green Core approached their MHG training. So Gary, if I could, uh, if you could take access now of my screen. That's great, thank you, Adam. Okay, morning everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. So um, I'd just like to introduce myself. My name is Gary Rowland, um, and as it says, I'm the Compliance Training Manager for Green Corps based in Warrington. Uh, we are, uh, well, one of the UK's leading manufacturers of own label products. So if you've ever bought a ready meal, a sandwich, a jar of pickled onions from a supermarket, the chances are it will have been made at one of our sites. And I'm just going to be talking to you today really about the journey we went on at our manufacturing site in Warrington and some of the challenges and successes we've had looking at how we can have a successful training event. Sorry, the screen seems to be uh, lagging slightly. So when I joined the business back in 2017, uh, the site was going through a rebuild and we had quite a number of challenges. Uh, we had a brand new delivery of completely new MHE stock that was unfamiliar to the site. The site itself had completely changed. So we had workers who'd worked here previously not knowing where trucks were gonna go. We were using two different management systems uh, to manage our fleet of MHE stock. We'd seen an increased pool of operators for the trucks that we were using. There was absolutely no auditing whatsoever. So where we had people who'd maybe been trained five, 10, 15 years ago um, on a reach truck, for example, we weren't confident that actually we could find copies of their training records, or in fact, that they'd had the correct training in the first place. We were seeing an increasing number of accidents and near misses, um, and just generally the mismanagement of that training in general was a concern for us because we were seeing, as I've said, a, a, an increasing number of uh, accidents, damage to property, damage to product, uh, and we needed to do something about it. Okay, go to the next slide. What this meant for us um, was that we could draw a line in the sand accept that what we'd had wasn't perfect, um, but introduce a new standard and we would stick to that. At the time, we had a mixture of an in-house trainer and some external training. Um, and what we did was we actually recruited a dedicated uh, MHE instructor, put them through all the relevant training, although they were highly experienced in the first place. We decided to harmonize the fleet management process. So instead of using two management systems, we could use one. And that gave us real visibility and control over our drivers and our stock. We implemented a rigorous auditing procedure and we reduced the pool of drivers by working with our operations teams to establish what they actually needed in terms of numbers of people who were trained to use this equipment. We were able to improve the skills of the drivers that do operate the trucks. So this wasn't a case anymore of saying, okay, You've been on your training, off you go, and we'll see you again in three years' time. 
we wanted to make sure that the learning process for them was continuous after they left the classroom. We've been able to see a reduction in the number of accidents in their misses, which I'll talk to you about shortly. And we've been able to really work with our stakeholders in supply chain and operations to really bring to life this vision of what for us is a, a perfect scenario. What that meant for us, and this uh, goes back a bit to uh, Liam's piece earlier of, of how you establish the training needs. We agreed the standards with the business. How many operators do they need? At what level of training? What kind of trucks are they going to be operating? And were we going to work with an accrediting body? Because up until that point, we'd only issued in-house certification. We agreed a training schedule and set standards for no-shows, cancellations and fails. The training is delivered by our in-house instructor and they have unannounced observations from myself uh, and other members of the l &D community who come in to ensure that the training that's being delivered is up to our standard. The results and feedback are given to the driver. The fleet management system, the training management system and ACORNs are updated the, the moment that the candidate has found out that they've been successful. The operator is released back into the business and we establish the refresher training requirements for us. That means using our fleet management system to ensure that where an operator is eligible for refresher training, if they miss that, they physically won't be able to operate one of the vehicles. It will not allow them to operate that truck if they've not got the right certification and that that certification is in date. Now, I know for some of you, this process might seem quite rudimentary uh, and a lot of you are probably already doing some something like this but for us none of this was in place it was very much a oh I need someone training on a truck today and off they go and, and have some training so this for us was really about putting a, a framework in place that was really going to work for us and for the business and what that's meant for us uh, you can see here um, quite clearly if you look at the data between January and July 2020, we had 51 high level impacts. So um, that is anything where there's been damage to uh, a, the property, uh, a person, our stock, anything like that. Uh, so yeah, 51. In the same time period in 2021, we've been able to reduce that by just over 50%. So we've had so far 24 high level impacts. Don't get me wrong, 24 is still 24 too many. But to say that we've been able to reduce our impacts by over 50% is a massive achievement for us. And I'm confident that we're probably one of the only sites that would be able to clearly demonstrate using this data the impact that this training system has had for us. So for me, thinking about how you can get this right and again, to some of you, I understand this might seem quite simplistic or sensible, but for us, this is something we've really had to draw back to every single day, is making sure you've got your data right and utilising the systems that you have, where you can automate processes and reports. I would do that because using data helps you to bring a story to life. Using that data is a really easy way of engaging with your stakeholders and getting them on board. Certainly, if you're in a business that is very KPI and very MI driven, then data is the thing that will convince your stakeholders to, to come along on the journey with you. And get your operators and managers on board. There's an understanding with them that they are equally as responsible for making sure our people are safe as we are in the training and HR functions or the ops manager, duty manager, whatever you might be. Actually, if you're the one utilizing, that piece of equipment, you need to take responsibility for your safety and the safety of your colleagues. So for me, the three things I would probably want to take away is if you can use an accrediting body, it's definitely better to do so. An in-house certificate is only valuable to the person whilst they're working for that business. Um, as a company that's heavily audited, it certainly gives our auditors a lot more confidence when they can see the training that we're delivering is assessed against an external awarding body. And accreditation also allows you to show your colleagues that 
you're doing something that is recognized and that they can use those skills transferably if they move to another business. So again, it's, it's a benefit to that person. I, I would always, always go back to data uh, because data is the one thing that allows us to make decisions and demonstrate value. It's not um, an easy process using anecdotal information to try and win uh, when you're trying to convince your senior leadership team to get on board with a piece of delivery. Using data allows you to do that. And certainly for us working with AITT, using ACORNS has been a really simple way for us to be able to ensure that our data is managed properly and validate. So as I mentioned earlier, it isn't enough for us to be able to just bring someone into a classroom every three years, put them through some training and send them on the way. Competency assessments, behavioural observations and familiarisation training are key. When that trainer, sorry, when that learner leaves the classroom, they know that they're going to see either myself or the instructor on a regular basis whilst they're actually doing their job. Where we'll just take a stand back and watch what they're doing, feedback to them and their manager on what we think could be improved or what was a success. And that's it from me. Back over to you, Adam. Thanks very much, Gary. Um, really appreciate that. Um, just to let you know, this next poll is now available to uh, vote on, and that is how do you review operator performance within your own organisation? Um, yeah, thanks very much, Gary, for that uh, presentation. I thought it was really interesting, uh, particularly how you identify the problems um, and put actions against them. Um, it seems like the uh, engaging the stakeholders is key, and certainly having your fleet management system there is really really helps you enable that um, and obviously standardizing your training as well so yeah it's really really interesting presentation that so thank you very much okay so on to our next speaker uh, this is uh, David Lee um, from the HSC um, David is um, grateful very very grateful for David's time today um, he's, uh, he's actually the representative within AI within the ABA um, as our kind of HSC uh, go-to person um, so David's got a presentation for us today and I need to let him share his screen. So I'm going to pass over to David now. Uh, David, if you could... Um... Good morning. I'll share my screen. Excellent. Um, just... Good morning. My name is David Lee. I'm a mechanical specialty inspector and I work for the Health and Safety Executive. And today I'm going to be talking about how HSC uh, do enforcement process and impact of, of a HSC accident investigation on a business. The presentation will go through certain areas. My overview will be what will HSC do after an accident has been reported how HSC investigates, what evidence should an organization have for training, and also looking at HSC's previous uh, prosecutions and training and your legal responsibilities. Next slide. As you were, HSC is a regulating body. These are a list of the law, not all the law, it's just a some of the areas which I think are important. As you know, we've got the top there, but the health and safety that work at. And moving through there, we've got pure Lola. And also one thing which I think people may understand is workplace health and safety and welfare regulation. I'm not sure if you're all aware, but what is HSC's role in an accident? So HSC typically investigate two to 3% of reported accidents. And also I think something to take into consideration is fatal accidents are around 50% around of these result in prosecution, which later in my presentation, I'll go into a bit more detail. HSC uh, also investigate accidents for a number of reasons, obviously to identify what went wrong why it went wrong and what can be done to make sure it doesn't happen again. And also lessons learned. 
Also, a lot of the information feeds back through video reporting back into HSC, so we can understand what organisations and what due shoulder, due shoulders are uh, failing on, and where we need to pinpoint our uh, inspections and also looking at investigations. I'm not sure if you're aware, um, I, I did enter into this uh, presentation talk, so I'm a mechanical specialist, which I'm a mechanical engineer, chartered engineer. The normally regulatory inspector is a, a regulatory inspector. So there's a difference between a specialist and a regulatory inspector. But we still hold warranted powers. I'm not sure you've seen what we talk about warranted powers. So we have the uh, power to enter non-domestic premises to investigate an accident. We also can turn up to any workplace if we feel there is any uh, untoward issues regarding health and safety. We also can interview anyone who can give us information about what led up to an accident or what happened afterwards. We can take photos, we can take samples, we can examine and also take copies of documents. And also we can record it in writing what happened. How we investigate. So we need to understand what happened. So there's an accident on the site. We may be looking for witnesses. Who's, who's was working in that vicinity? We can take witness statements. We were looking at key facts relating to the causes, identifying any immediate underlying causes, and notify, identifying any lessons learned. And one thing what may come on, onto this is that if there has been a breach of the law, at that stage, we will look to, to, to find out what is appropriate enforcement action. My next slide is just going to be talking around about uh, key messages in relation to training. As I said in my first slide, the law, by law, employers must give employees adequate training to ensure health and safety. So as it's been mentioned by the other speakers, when, it, when you join a company, the employees may, may join with existing qualification tickets, but the employers should still satisfy themselves that the employee can demonstrate those skills. So this is looking at carrying out your own assessment, monitoring and supervision. And also when new employers come to different organisations, they'll be exposed to different risks and also different environments. And also within that, they may have existing skills, but they may also become rusting and what require updating. In relation to the actual equipment we use, we're talking about industrial truck in the environment, they need to have some type of formalization training and also different trucks will have different operational uh, requirements within different environments, so different hazards and different uh, locations, obstacles, what they might be dealing with. And also there needs to be some type of transition with the training working in these, these environments. This will continue on that, and, and I mentioned on the messages of refresher trainings, upskill, and CPDs. This is continually monitoring and updating the employees of the going through the organisations. So it's recalibrating each employee with, with the skill sets, so addressing those bad habits. And also supervision. Employees need to monitor employees' skills and keep them up to date and for the relevant current tasks and how to, so if the tasks change, then the, that training gets re, uh, revisited. If there's different hazards or the, the, the areas being moved around with transportation, again, it goes back into the training, reformalization and supervision. The next slide is unfortunately, things do happen within work on organizations where this duty holder has uh, unfortunately breached the law in relation to the other fine of 600,000. 
I'm not going to read it word for word, but as you can see in bold there, is that the company uh, pleaded guilty to breaching Section 31 of the Health and Safety at Work Act. That, in a sense, is that the company is responsible for its, its employees and other employees who don't work for them on their site. So in relation to you've got an agency worker working on site, you've still got responsibilities for that agency worker on your site. Next slide. Again, another uh, fine, which is a high sum again, which is something you, you go through here. This information is, is available on the Health and Safety uh, HSC's work site, website which is freely available and you can see typical prosecutions which, which go through from various different duty holders. As you can see there, we've got a, the company pleaded guilty again in breaching the section 201 health and safety at work app and the fine was around 107,000. So this is again where it, it just shows dividends that the, the, the employer needs to make sure he, he follows the duties of, in relation to law. So again, I'm looking at here is training and your legal responsibilities. I said from the first slide to comply with the law, employees need to have the skills, knowledge and experience to carry out their duties safely. Organisations should take into account their employees' capabilities and ensure that demands of the job do not exceed their ability to do the work without themselves the risk to others. Another thing here, what I've mentioned is everyone in the organisation requires adequate health and safety training. And we move further down this side, slide is that people should be competent for their work. If they undertake training along with knowledge, experience and skill and all these intertwining each other because this is what builds a confident competence going through the um, organisation and going through the employees um, development through the business. And thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much for that, David. And um, we're just launching the next poll now. Um, screen. Um, yes, thank you very much for the next the next poll has been launched. Um, should your company have an incident that requires HSE investigation? How confident do you feel about the current policies and procedures you have in place to mitigate the risk of a workplace transport incident? Um, yeah, that's a really great presentation, uh, David. I really appreciate you sharing that with us and um, really highlighting the importance of adequate training um, and obviously some of the fines there you know, it really highlights um, the seriousness that the HSE take as well with, with some of these investigations. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for that. We, we're now going to move on to our last speaker. Um, so we'll just that. Sorry, the last speaker is uh, Simon Ambridge from um, Matthew Clark. He's the Risk and Compliance Manager. Uh, Simon's uh, been a member with AITT for a number of years. Uh, Simon also sits on the AITT Council, um, which helps uh, AITT develop its standards and its schemes. So um, I'll pass you over to Simon now. <laughs> Excuse me. Simon, if you could just take control of the screen. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, uh, good morning. Um, as Adam said, uh, my name is uh, Simon Ambridge, and I'm the risk and compliance manager for a business called uh, Matthew Clark. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I'm just waiting for the slides to come across. Um, and my briefly wanted to go through this morning was about how we as a business evaluate. MIT training. Um, we all know the importance of, uh, of training, but there's this added bit at the back end of it, ensuring that the training is suitable for, for our staff and for our operations. So, just a little 
little bit about um, Matthew Clark. Sorry, this isn't a slide that I'm catching up. Um, so, Matty Parker, alcohol wholesaler and distributor. Um, we also run a small business that does events. So, we supply infrastructure and bars to um, big events such as um, Car Fest, British Summertime. Um, so, we have a, a quite a, a diverse um, uh, portfolio of, uh, of, of, of jobs in different parts of the business. Uh, we mainly operate from 10 warehouses across the UK and currently we've got 100 pieces of um, lift truck equipment and we've got approximately 200 employees registered and authorised um, to use the equipment. Um, as you can see from the, uh, the slide, there's just three examples of some of the instances that we used to have uh, within our business. Um, five years ago, when we started the process, we, over a three year period, we had about 41 accidents regarding MIG. Um, it only counted for about 2.5% of our total of our. Uh, accidents uh, throughout the group, but as we all know, with MOT, when we have, when we have an accident, it, it, it's going to be uh, it's going to be bad. It's not going to be good. Um, so for us, we had a quite robust process of um, training. We had a, a a process for refresher training, but what we never done is we never evaluated how good that training was. And why we were comfortable that we, we technically applied with the law. We never actually drilled down to see if our operators um, put that training on board. Um, we had a mixture of both in house uh, instructors and we also had some external instructors to use. Um, so it was just important for us that we went through a evaluation. Um, there we go. So, before we embarked on, 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 on how we were going to evaluate, it, it was important that um, we could be confident that we formed a partnership with both um, a, a trade body that we could have confidence in, um, but we also wanted to form a recap of one stop shop where we could get access to updates and legislation and uh, good practice um, and it was also important that we had a process where we could check instructors coming on our site so we weren't the only business at the time where we had, where we had a external trainer coming on site and it turned out he'd done five knots of candidates in two days um, and that resulted in a week later in some quite um, bad damage from rushes. So we engaged our primary authority partner as well as a HSC inspector. Um, and, and through that, then discussions we opted to work with, uh, with the AITC. Um, Part, part of the uh, part of that program is also um, just we needed a process where we could be confident where we had agency workers coming in, even though we provided familiarisation and all the job training, that we could never have a process where we could actually validate a candidate or an agency training system where the where the implication of ACORN's by the AITC has, has provided us with like, an extra level of um, confidence. Um, so when we started to look at the AITC, when we started to look at um, this, 
see that the training was um, was good and whether we were getting the right results. We looked at four different levels. So the first level was reaction. So was the training engaging? Next, it did operators actually acquire the knowledge that we wanted them to have? Um, and then the last two, which perhaps is more important, was the knowledge. It was the training applied to people on the job, and did the training have the required um, outcome? Um, so to help start that process, we we, we ran two two methods. We um, we had a method of observation where we split all our warehouses into four, um, and we monitored um, four areas of goods in, picking, replenishment, and goods out. Um, we engaged some corporate truck instructors, and we used the AICC um, testing sheet as our um, as our place to do the observations, um, and prior to going on a, a, a training package for all our sites, we, we've done a number of um, observations and then we then done observations post-training. Um, each area we spent about 30 minutes uh, doing the observations and we, in a total in post and pre-training, we acquired um, over 3,000 observations on a chart just to see where we were going. Um, so yeah, as I said, we were getting the structured, um, structured observations. Um, the second tool that we used was a questionnaire, and it was broken down into three sections were the uh, candidate or the staff one happy with the learning that was given them. Um, did it change their attitude? Um, and what other action plans did we have to put in place? Um, the results um, it keeps, the, keeps the company updated on how operators see working conditions, safety equipment, and performance. So we just didn't stop. Um, doing the monitoring every every half year, we go through another process of just doing observations in our warehouse, just to make sure that the uh, staff um, are following what they should uh, be doing. So it's basic things like our operators wearing seatbelts, our operators found in the hall going around blind corners, and it just gives us this confidence that um, the operators are, are behaving properly. But it also gives us confidence that our supervisors are, are also keeping an eye on what's going on on the shop floor. Um, because I think one of the biggest weaknesses that we all have is the actual supervision of, um, of employees. So some of the lessons that we've learned is that um, over the past 48 months, our MOT incidents have all both reached zero. Um, now, we do have quite a robust process for reporting accidents that we're confident in. Um, but the other outcome of having structured observations, um, having structured training programs, and monitoring the training programs is that our near miss incident rates have gone off the chart. Um, and why some people might be worried about that, to me, that gives us the evidence that um, the behavioral training program is starting to pay dividends. Um, again, um, we've had a massive reduction in MOT hits and racking, um, which has saved us a, a large, uh, large sum of money. Um, but the other thing about the AICT, and, I, and, I, and I, I do keep on banging the drum on this to other organisations, is that it provides us a platform to find information on standards and updates. To me, it's really important that we're up, 
that's the date that everything that's going on in the industry. And the last piece for me is, is open. The fact that there's now a robust system where we can check people's training records, um, it, 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 it's just unmeasurable. The other thing that also did for us, and the other thing that I talk to, to, to other people in the industry, is that we're all suffering a, um, a shortage of, of competent staff. And ACORN is, is providing a great platform where we can give our staff transferable skills. And by providing that helps us to keep staff. Um, and and that, that's just a very brief overview on, on how we're, we're monitoring um, MAG training and how operators operate in the warehouse. Um, so engaging the workforce it is really important. Don't, don't ignore people. Don't think they're just things in the mind. Normally they not. Um, talk to them, understand what, how, what they're feeling. And it's almost also really important to measure the safety performance. Have a KPI, use um, the AIT training standards as a, as a platform to measure in-house safety performance. Um, and the last one that I, I, I do say is no systems to be perfect. So don't, don't be afraid to talk to people like the ARC. Don't be trying to phone the HSC up or the local website. Um, you're far better off being honest than up front. And that way, when you're having to put in new systems or new ways of learning, everyone's going to call. Um, and that's it for me. Um, I'd give you it back, Adam. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Simon, for that. I can back on. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Simon. We've just launched our last poll, um, which is a bit of a summary, really, for today. Um, have you learned anything from today's webinar? That I think make you think differently about your company's approach to MHE training. Um, yes, again, thank you very much, uh, Simon, for your your um, presentation there. I suppose it's a bit similar to to Gary's in some respects, where you identify the areas of concern, put an action plan together. I think it was really interesting your structured observations that you have for your trainers. They seem to work really well. Um, and particularly questionnaires for operators is, is something I've not seen before. And I think it's a great way of getting feedback uh, from the kind of end users, I suppose. So yeah, uh, thank you very much for that. So that's all our speakers done uh, for now. Um, we are slightly over on time, um, but just brings us really to our kind of like the end of the end of the event, really. And this is where we've got uh, so a little bit of time for some questions. Um, so we've received some questions through uh, today while we've been on the uh, on the call. Um, plus I've had a few come through on email as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me. If I want to um, invite any of the panelists to to take on these questions, uh, there's a few that's come through here. Um, I'm happy to answer the first one I can see, uh, which is from Chris Budd. Um, Chris has asked with the present climate of factor. There has never been a better time to implement theory e-learning into the MHE sector, followed up by practical training by the provider. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to answer that one. Um, absolutely, Chris. Um, obviously, we've uh, a lot has happened in the last 24 months or so, um, and um, e-learning has certainly taken, um, it's certainly been on the forefront of a lot of people's minds. Um, I think from AITT's point of view. Um, e-learning has certainly been something we've looked at and we've discussed with our council um, and we think it has a really good application in certain uh, in certain examples um, i suppose predominantly the the manager supervisor training where people are probably more likely to have access to the relevant equipment um, and facilities to conduct that uh, regarding operator training um, i think we're still kind of really reviewing the situation at the moment um, the moment with um, we need to look at what the benefit is the overall demand as well um, and how effective and would that actually reduce um, the course and add, add any benefits, not just to um, the candidate, but the employer and also the train provider as well. So it certainly is a subject that we are discussing greatly. And 
you know, the, the, a lot has changed in, in the last, last couple of years, and who, know, who knows where we're going to go in the next in the next few years. But I think it's important that we're we're engaged and aware of of where we make improvements when when necessary and when required. Okay, um, so Gary, there's a question here for you if you want my mind taking this one, if you can see it. Can you see those questions? Yeah, so this is the what internal and external obstacles might affect the training programme. Yes. Is that the one? Yeah. Um, so I think for us, the challenges around bringing in a, a new regime so much is that any, any kind of training intervention, whether it's MHE or not, is about the desire to bring in a change that affects either knowledge, skills or behaviour. For us, we were focusing less on knowledge and skills, surprisingly, for training. This was really about behaviour, because what we had was a group of colleagues who were using our MHE um, in a way that they'd been taught and had sort of uh, a culture had grown around you know, oh, I've not brought my key in today, can I borrow yours? Or, oh, I've just uh, dented a wall, uh, but no one saw, so I don't need to report it. It was the really poor practices that were the challenge for us. Um, I would say externally, there weren't really any obstacles because we, we made a conscious decision to bring everything in-house. Internally, it was about the challenging culture and behaviour piece because I think actually there's probably still an element of that today that we see, certainly with some of our shop floor operatives. Um, but certainly what helped us with that, again, I'll go back to if we engage with our stakeholders at the right time and agree what is an acceptable level of behaviour, acceptable level of use, acceptable number of operators, you can't then get away from that. And so what we had to do was really say, this is the framework that we're going to work in and you either really come on this journey with us or you don't but we won't deviate from this plan that we've set okay thank you very much gary um there's another question here um liam i don't know if you want to take this one on um what are your instructor qualifications and how are they trained and evaluated yes yeah, sure no worries adam so um an aitc instructor would need to sit a 10-day course first to become an instructor and then every five years they would need to attend a re-registration to ensure they're still at that required standard um, they need so yeah 10 day course first and then it would be um, a re-reg every five years okay thank you very much um we have uh, a question here which probably simon or gary could answer um has recruiting in-house instructors helped your business financially as opposed to outsourcing the training externally. Simon, do you want to take that one on? Um, I think I think there's two parts to it. Um, the reason why we um, brought in-house instructors in is because we had peak periods of trading and sometimes we, we might have to bring in either a five agency staff in with 24 hour closure. So we don't, it's very difficult to get an external instructor in um, at short notice. Um, I must admit the preference is for external instructors where we can program it in. Um, so it's not a case about saving money, it's about providing the flexibility to the business. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, got a couple more questions here. Um, this one here, what's this? I suppose this anyone can answer this if they feel comfortable to. Uh, what can the speakers suggest to improve companies' knowledge and understanding of the importance of completing all three stages of training, especially familiarization and specific job training? So this kind of relates to what I talked about at the beginning with the L17. Um Anybody want to take that one on? I think um, one of the things we did, uh, as well as the operator training, was we put all our managers um, through some training as well, which was about managing uh, MHE operations safely. And again, you know, this is about them having that knowledge and understanding that it isn't just down to the operator and it isn't just down to the business. 
there is an element for all of us here about taking responsibility and accountability for ensuring the safety of our people and our products and our premises. Um, so I think that certainly helped for us. I think um, certainly where those businesses are sending colleagues for training off site, it isn't the same environment that they'll then be working in. So familiarization training is key. They will then need to encourage colleagues when they come back to site to spend some time with a, a supervisor or an appointed person in the environment they actually work in to understand how they're gonna maneuver that equipment around safely, depending on the restrictions that might be in place locally. I think for us, because we do the training internally and because we do it partly in a dedicated training environment, but then we take them into a live environment that allows us to do that familiarization piece there and then. But equally, what I would say is, it's not just about that initial training intervention. For me, it's got to be about those behavioral safety observations and competency assessments throughout the life cycle of that person's time using that equipment. Don't just assume that because they've done the court, we've done it ourselves. Anyone who drives, the minute you get your driving license, you throw everything you've learned from your lessons out the window. And it's no different uh, with someone be, uh, you know, having a, an MHE license. It's all about making sure you keep on top of the standards because the, it does come to a point where the operator thinks, I'll just do it properly for the sake of someone not nagging me for not doing my pre-start inspection properly. I'll just do the right thing this time. Right. Thanks very much, Gary, for that. Um, we've probably got time for one more question. Any other questions we've not answered? Because we've had quite a few come through. Um, we will get back to you on that one. We'll email you separately. Um, so I don't know if David, are you still uh, are you still there? There's a question that's come through here that I'm not sure if you can help. Yeah, um, I can hear to see that one. Brilliant. Is that relating to the accident accident statistics? That's right, yeah. Yeah, based based on that, there's a uh, a mandatory uh, HSE kind of um, level of what accidents will be uh, investigated. So they've got to meet a threshold. So it might look low there. So for instance, when you when a video report goes into a, a system, it gets triaged and it's got to meet the certain levels of thresholds, for instance, like if someone's got a broken arm, multiple uh, fractures. So that all those all those um, levels of um, accident levels will get triaged and they will get investigated. And, and also, there could be uh, it could be down to um, complaints could come through from uh, other judge holders so that they've seen uh, X working practice going on. and also it could be multiple of uh, complaints going regarding that. For instance, there might be uh, one area somebody's may have uh, had slipped and slipped down and reported it, there might have something else, and that may cause a inspector to go into site and to do an investigation because it's looking at the uh, is there failing of health and safety within that organization and it's not just minor things, it could be a multiple of things. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for that. Um, so what we'll do is um, the end of this, um, I, I, we'll probably have to wrap up with the questions now, but any questions that I've not answered, we will get back to you. Um, so just going to take us to the last slide now. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you for everyone who's joined us today on this on this call. Um, particularly the, the, the panellists have given up a lot of their time and the time spent to produce the presentation. So really appreciate everyone's input on this. Um, also, thank you for JKC Marketing, who have helped put this event together as well. Um, with regards to the webinar itself, the whole event has been recorded. So we are going to be making this available for everyone to view again. Um, and we will divide it up into different individual speakers as well. Um, so that will be available on our website probably in the next day or so. Um, and just lastly, don't forget about the resources page that, we, that Liam mentioned earlier uh, in his presentation. That will be on the AITT website in the news page. So you just need to click on that and then there's a link there to the information you need. So yeah, that's really everything for today. I really appreciate everyone's time and hope you enjoyed the event and I will speak to you all soon. Thank you very much.